Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Neil Walgren. Thanks for being on the show, Neil. Thanks for having me, Whitney. Neil brings nearly two decades of leadership in operations and capital markets. Prior to MAG Capital Par Partners, he led a Bay Area real estate investment firm, raising capital for over $200 million in projects. Before that, Neil piloted the C-130 in both the Air Force and Navy, logging over 2,500 flight hours with combat tours in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and concluding his military career as a lieutenant commander. Neil, first First off, thank you for your service. Uh, I've, I've ridden in a few C-130s personally and, and appreciate uh, those guys that know how to do that, get us where we need to go uh, safely, right? So Absolutely. very important uh, task there you had and grateful for your service uh, as always. So, uh, but, you know, now you are, uh, you know, you're not in the military anymore, but you are, you know, you've got a great business going here and, and you play a vital role. Um, why don't you give us a little more into, you know, MAG Capital Partners, what your all's focus is, uh, and maybe let's dive into the asset class and, and your specialty. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, a, you know, it's a boutique investment firm. We um, raise equity through syndication, um, through a network of investors. And our specialty, our you know, kind of core competency is industrial real estate. And we are buying, ultimately buying industrial real estate, typically tenanted by manufacturing firms. Um, so we play in that manufacturing space and we buy our real estate through sale leaseback. So we are buying the real estate from owner occupants who then turn around and sign long-term single tenant net lease, typically 15, 20 year term structures on the back end. Um, so that that's the niche we've carved out. We've been doing fairly successfully for the last eight or 10 years. Okay. Tell us a little about maybe the, uh, the environment or, or, you know, just current environment in, in the industrial space. Uh, you obviously after the last year, everything that's, that's happened, you know, what, what's, uh, maybe what's happened to that space? Has it been good or bad? What have you seen? What do you expect? Yeah, absolutely. It's, so I found a lot of folks don't have a lot of exposure to industrial, even if they you know have a somewhat sizable portfolio in multifamily or retail. So you know, on a macro level, you know, really industrial can take several forms. Um, typically, you're looking at you know largely manufacturing, but you also have warehouse distribution. You know, you can think everything from ultimately four walls and a roof that houses production, uh, or you can look at, hey, this is useful space in the logistics and transport of goods. You know, think say an Amazon delivery distribution hub or, you know, Home Depot, whatever that might look like. Uh, and then you also have specialty industrial and that might be, you know, R&D labs, uh, very specialized, you know, high capital, uh, high price per square foot, very custom build for that tenant that's gonna be occupying the space. So in that space as a whole, you know, our focus is on the, the manufacturing side. We typically are buying, you know, roughly not A-class properties, you know, usually properties that were built maybe, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Oftentimes they've, you know, had periodic improvements done to them over the years. Um, and ultimately that space has seen a huge amount of increased demand, especially over the last roughly three years or so, uh, especially with the rise of e-commerce with, more and more you know, deliveries, um, you're seeing a, you know, really a limited amount of supply. New build goes for you know, roughly $100, $150 a square foot. Um, so the existing supply that you know, you're able to buy between $50 and $70 a square foot has this kind of irreplaceable component to it from a price perspective. So as these new uses and as e-commerce come up and as you know, more and more you know, distribution networks, you know, building out these larger companies and able to service a larger customer base. We're seeing a lot of increased demand pressure on industrial, and that's been really driving the cap rates, squeezing them a little bit um, in a way it's similar that we've seen on other desirable asset classes like multifamily over the last few years. Nice. So is there a, uh, maybe a recent deal that you could elaborate on and, and, and maybe we can highlight some of the things that are different about this asset class that uh, a lot of us aren't exposed to as much on the industrial side? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
you know, I'll use a, you know, a recent one that we closed, I think it was in November, or December last year. And it was a company tenanted by a firm called Huntington Solutions. And this was, you know, really right down the fairway type of tenant. Um, typically what we're buying before we jump into the deal itself, really um, it helps to understand what is the motivation behind why a company would want to do a sale lease back. So this firm had recently been acquired by a private equity group and that private equity group bought this company. What the company makes is high density foam end caps. So their customers are appliance manufacturers, electronics manufacturers who require these kind of laser cut end caps that go around their expensive you know, products that then they ship and are able to ship in a way that doesn't damage them. Um, you've probably seen them. So you buy a, a Roomba or even a washing machine. It's going to have those you know, very dense foam uh, end caps in order to protect them. So that's what these guys make. And they got acquired by a private equity group. And that private equity group likes to really focus and streamline their investment into the operational side of their new portfolio company. If that portfolio company also came with the real estate, PE groups will oftentimes sell us the real estate and turn around and take a tenant position, signing a brand new absolute triple net, typically 20 year term lease. And it makes sense for them because they're able to extract the money out of the real estate, reinvest it into you know, manufacturing, sometimes pay down some of the debt that they took on to acquire that portfolio company, basically deleverage that acquisition or even you know, additional headcounts. Really what they do best is just invest in that new operating company in order to grow in the way that they feel they can through that acquisition. So is, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I guess it allows them to focus on what they're good at, right? Focus on their business model, what their, I mean, their specialty is and not real estate. Absolutely. Yeah. And it really, I would, I find the approach, I mean, you can expand that in so many different fields to just focus on your core competency and realize, you know, for those guys, they say, Hey, if we invest in the business, this is what we are experts at. And they really, you know, they're like, maybe we can make some money owning real estate, but we are not real estate investors by trade. We are private equity by trade. So by removing that investment piece out of real estate and doubling down on their, really their operational company investment, they're able to, you know, put all their money in their core competency. And that provides opportunity for a group like us that specializes in owning real estate. And really it's a win-win on both sides. That is, it is interesting because I, I mean, that would be my first thought or question is, well, why would they do that? Right. Why Absolutely. would they sell their property, but stay there? And, you know, it was, it, I guess it would make me think, well, are they planning to leave or are they planning? What's, what's the problem? <laughs> right. Uh, and I, yeah. you probably get that from investors a lot, I would imagine. Is that right? Absolutely. You know, that the whole nature of it seems a little, I would say foreign to a lot of investors who maybe haven't seen that in other types of investments before, but really it makes sense. And from our side, as a real estate investment group, we are effectively buying real estate and, and we are buying a very predictable known set of cash flow streams that come from rents that are predetermined and structured by the lease. And we have completely removed the operational risk component. So there is no you know, roof replacements that affect our cash flow. There's no, you know, the tax assessor can double the taxes on the property. All that goes on the tenant. The insurance premiums could double. All that goes on the tenant. So as an ownership group, as an investment group, we really have a high degree of certainty what that cash flow will look like, even three, four, or five years down the road. I mean, almost to the cent. So I can structure an incredibly predictable set of cash flow to my investors. Uh, and ultimately, all, all that cash flow is tied to the risk of the credit of the tenant. And it's important to understand the, the risk of any deal and how that maybe differs from other asset classes. I mean, is it accurate that you're, you're mostly just removing that debt piece for them? Um, can you elaborate on that a little? Just like, I mean, like they still, they're still covering the roof if it needs repairing or they're paying the taxes, which they were doing all that before you purchased the property, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so now the big piece is that they don't own the real estate. They don't have the debt there. So they have that capital back if there was equity in the property. Uh, but either way, uh, now, I mean, that's really, is that the biggest thing that they're, that's, that's changed? Yeah, absolutely. And, and also from a uh, balance sheet treatment, there's a lot of advantages of being a renter versus an owner. 
Um, the main two, you're able to write off 100% of your rent payments. Whereas if you're an owner and you have that mortgage, um, your you know, amount that you're able to write off is much smaller, you know, a smaller component of the mortgage interest only. Uh, and then the second piece is from a balance sheet standpoint, if a company is an owner and they have a mortgage on that piece of real estate, then they have a huge long-term liability on their balance sheet. Whereas if they convert that over to a, a renter position, now there's, there's a, typically a sub note on the bottom of the balance sheet that mentions that lease liability, but it's not put on the assets and liabilities in the same way that having a formal mortgage is. Tell me a little about the typical, say, business plan or hold period, you know, things like that on a project like this. Yeah, so we come in as an ownership group. We negotiate both the price of the real estate and the terms of the lease that we're turning around and leasing back to the, the selling company for it. So those, those two pieces, there's a lot more work that happens up front because of that, you know, kind of two-pronged approach. And there's a little bit of an art form as well. You know, for example, if I have a, a seller who says, hey, I want to maximize proceeds from this sale, I might say, okay, you know, we will give you on the higher end of market price for the building, but you're going to turn around and rent it back at the higher end of the rent rate. Or they might say, hey, we want a low price per square foot rent. Say, okay we'll buy on the low end of market, you know, the range there and, and lease it back to you on the lower end. So you're really able to kind of finesse and find a win-win with your seller. And either way, you're still able to more or less uh, create the same amount of yield for your investors. Um, so we, we come in, we take ownership. Really, once, once you take ownership, there's not a lot of operational churn. You know, most of that work is done up front. Um, so we'll typically hold about five years. And that's intentional. You know, we're, we're building equity in the project. We're paying down principal. Oftentimes, if the private equity backers are successful, that tenant company is actually able to expand. And now I'm sitting on a more valuable piece of real estate because that tenant uh, credit has improved over the years. Um, so ultimately, after about five years, we go to sell. And it's, it's a, you know, I would say attractive sale to the next party because there's still roughly 15 years left on that net lease. So the next buyer is able to, to buy it, to hold it, still get a decent amount of term, and they could even turn and sell it to another group before you know, a releasing event or a re-up actually has to happen. So is your goal to be that the first buyer you know, from the entity that's operating there? Absolutely. And you know, by doing that, we've more or less removed the releasing risk from these investments, which is Fine. And, and other groups, you know, tend to like that additional risk that comes, you know, will they or will they not release? And you might be able to buy at a premium or, or excuse me, at a discount in that scenario. But, you know, for our kind of risk tolerance and business model that we've built, we like being on the front end of that brand new lease. Okay. No, that's interesting. What about your, your um, markets that you're located in? Or is this something you're doing nationwide? Uh, do you have some specific places you're looking Typically, and really it's twofold. So one, we're buying in the Midwest first for cap rates and we just see really a better, you know, more, more rent dollars per you know, dollar of, of real estate um, through those higher cap rates that we find in the Midwest compared to the coastal markets. And then the second piece is for manufacturing, really most of our tenant companies, they produce and distribute nationwide. So being quasi centrally located there in the middle of the US makes sense from a geographic standpoint. We're buying a lot of Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Iowa, Indiana, Michigan, really right up in that, that central corridor there, um, the Midwest and Texas. I used to just say the Midwest and I've had some Texans uh, let me know <laughs> that <laughs> those are two very separate markets, but, uh, it, but yeah, that's, that's our bread and butter spot. Get your free copy of A Guide to Passively Investing in Commercial Real Estate. Inside, you'll learn the basics of passive income and real estate syndication, what kind of returns you can expect, how to find a sponsor, and how to evaluate the risks. Download your copy in the show notes or visit lifebridgecapital.com forward slash invest better to start your investment journey. Would it be accurate to say that like the location in, in your uh, asset class is, is not as important as it is in almost every other aspect of real estate? I mean, like the, it's important, but I just mean like your, your, the importance of your tenant is so much more important, I guess. And if they're, like you said, if they're distributing all over the country, uh, you know, the immediate location of their building may not be as important 
I mean, I guess unless you wanted to sell it or when you need to sell, if, if the tenant had issues and had to leave or something like that. Yeah, no, you hit the nail on the head there, Whitney. It, you know, especially compared to multifamily and, you know, I have about 30% of my personal portfolio is, is multifamily. I love it. Don't get me wrong, but going from, you know, a multifamily project where it's location, location, demographics, you know, sub-market demographics. I really need to know that like the back of my hand in order to be successful, especially if I plan on, you know, increasing rents and occupancy and, you know, really making an investment and hoping to see the return from that. On the single tenant side, really the the location and sub-market is way less important than the credit of your tenant. And that, that, I mean, really, you're making a gamble. You're going in and you're saying, hey, I have 100% occupancy. I am making a really an educated bet that my tenant will stay financially solvent, will not default on the lease for the roughly four to five years that I plan on owning this real estate. So from that side, rather than you know, doing heavy you know, market reports and demographic studies, what we actually do is, is produce what's called a credit memo. And we have, you know, a supplementary seven to eight page document that supplements our investment summaries. And that credit memo really deep dives into you know, financial summaries, balance sheets, you know, debt loads, customer diversification. And we have a, a really top-notch credit analyst on our team who creates these reports. And that is the, the fundamental background on the due diligence side for these kind of investments. What about uh, any, I mean, what's the biggest risk in a, in a, asset like that? Yeah. I mean, really there's several things that would happen before probably the, the place you don't want to be is sitting on an empty building, right? Especially if it's somewhat tertiary. <laughs> so, you know, we do, we have several safeguards. Uh, one of them, for instance, is we work in our leases. Our tenants are required to submit quarterly and audited annual financial statements to us. So we are wow. keeping a, a very close, you know, kind of pulse on that economic health of our tenant. And, you know, in general, you can have a down quarter. That's fine. You know, we're just kind of keeping an eye on it. But if you started seeing some trends where profitability is starting to squeeze or revenues are dropping, we could start that conversation early and say, hey, you know, what's going on? Do we need to, you know, how do we work with you on this? What are your plans? You know, and really get ahead of the ball. Do we need to start, you know, trying to find a new tenant early before these guys are out? Do we do a lease modification? You know, a, a huge amount of, of steps in between you know, the day they start having trouble and the day that we get a notice of defaults on the lease there. But, you know, fast forward, if they did run into real trouble, what would probably happen is they would likely sell the tenant company to a private equity group that specializes in distressed asset purchases. And with that, they would ultimately buy the obligations of that lease with it. So they would probably restructure the tenant company, keep that lease obligation. So as a, as a investment group, it really wouldn't affect us much. And then ultimately at the very end, if we were to have a full, you know, if they declared chapter 11, defaulted and exited the lease, then ultimately the due diligence we did up front on making sure we're buying good real estate with a defendable basis. Ultimately, now, now we have that building and we go through the re releasing process in order to get it refilled. Nice. Okay. No, it's just interesting to hear about a different asset classes uh, and, and risks that you see there. So we're aware of that also. Uh, how do you prepare for a downturn in a, in a, in a property like this? It's really, a, it's your homework you do up front. So, yeah. you know, with, with these, that due diligence period up front is huge. And what's nice is these tenant companies have history. And what I mean by that, I would say our, our average tenant tenure, if you will, most of them have been in business 50, 60, 70. I mean, we just had a tenant company that's been around 90 years now. I mean, wild. So these, these guys have seen so many downturns. They have you know, substantial operations. Most of them pull in close to $100 million a year in revenue. So they have cash reserves. They know how to responsibly run their business. They know how to change with you know, changes in consumer behavior. And the last piece is we focus on real estate tenanted by what I call B2B one level up companies. And so they are, they are not selling to end users. Most of them are creating intermediate parts. For example, you know, that foam company is not selling to you and I, you know, they're selling to a, a appliance manufacturer, right? Um, we had an, another company recently made aerospace parts. These guys create custom parts for about seven or eight major aerospace manufacturers. So they, they have a huge amount of B2B relationships. So really, you know, ups and downs of events, say like COVID, 
affect these type of B2B type of industries a lot less, uh, or at least not as quickly. So they're able to, you know, I would say smooth out, flatten the curve, if you will, of, you know, supply and demand on what's affecting their businesses. It seems like, you know, like there's a whole nother layer of due diligence here, but just on the tenant's business, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. you need to know a lot about business to be able to assess if this is a great investment or not, uh, because the the life of that tenant's business is so important, crucially important. Uh, any, any tips on, on assessing that, that tenant's business like that before we have to move to a few final questions? Yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, if you're looking at investing in this as a passive investor for that, I mean, you can educate yourself a little bit on really credit analysis, you know, and everything from how say a private equity group looks at companies and there's some basic research out there, you know, what are good debt loads, et cetera. But I would say more so you're really, you are coming in on the coattails of an experienced sponsor who does this full time. And the biggest things you can look for are heavy sponsor co-invest. And if that sponsor has a lot of skin in the game, then as long as that sponsor has more to lose, if this thing goes south than you as an investor, you're sitting in a, in a good position. You know, ultimately that sponsor is motivated financially and by reputation to do what it takes and to do that due diligence in a way that is likely more than you as an individual investor would ever be able to do. And that's okay. You know, you don't need to be a, an expert at everything, but to make sure that you're investing with a group that has, you know, motivations aligned, in my opinion, is the most important part about looking at this asset class. Do you have any predictions, uh, Neil, just for the real estate market or, and you can be specific to your, your asset class, but uh, just for the next six to 12 months? So we've seen continued increasing attention and demand in the industrial space. And I'm not going to lie, we have seen a little bit of cap compression with larger investment groups, just, you know, bidding higher and higher for what you could get cheaper, you know, maybe a year or two ago. The offsetting factor of that is the whole idea of sale leaseback. At one point, you know, 10 years ago was somewhat of a rare financial instrument that companies would use in order to free up capital. Now it's becoming more and more, I would say, common and accepted. So we're seeing more supply because of the increased adoption of sale leaseback, but more limited supply because of more dollars chasing real estate. So from my assessment and what we've seen, you know, those two roughly cancel each other out in a way that we're probably going to continue to see operate, uh, continue to see, you know, decent deal flow and, and, you know, availability of, I would say competitive deals in this space. Um, but, you know, really it'll be interesting to see what happens with rates because as long as capital is cheap, I mean, people are having to put money somewhere and, you know, this asset class is becoming more exposed. So we may start to see a little bit of overpaying. And at that point, you know, you have to get more choosy on what we actually invest in. Neil, it's, uh, I love talking to other people that's been in the military as well and asking this question about uh, any daily habits that you're disciplined about that uh, have helped you achieve success. I, I am a, excuse my French, but a checklist Nazi. So <laughs> um, I, you know, as a pilot in the C-130, everything, I mean, we had pages of checklists. I mean, everything from opening the plane up to get into your seat, your pre-flights, your starting engines checklist, your before takeoff checklist, departure checklist, everything. And that checklist is designed over, I mean, years and years and years, a really accumulation of knowledge and expertise on how to do this skill repeatedly and in a way that is probably, you know, the safest and most efficient way that a huge community of folks have created. And, you know, for me personally, I do the same thing. I have, you know, every deal that we put together from due diligence to, you know, building materials or how we communicate uh, ongoing after close support with our investors, quarterly reports, monthly distributions. I mean, having a, a very repeatable system through the use of checklists for me creates consistency, not only for me, but for my investors as well. And it gives them repeatability and what I've found is it helps accelerate the process of building trust with us in a two-way street. No, that is awesome. Yeah. Those checklists are important, especially when you're a pilot, right? I mean, yeah. it is for anybody, <laughs> but man, you know, anybody else riding on there hopes you're, you're using that checklist. Uh, oh yeah. So, I wish I could say I had it all up here, but I mean, you, you forget, right? So you need that, right. that paper to, well, to go back to. What's your best source for meeting new investors right now? 
Oh, wow. We do. I mean, really, we've, we've started a kind of internal practice of active referrals. And, you know, when I finish conversations with folks, you know, I'll leave it open and say, hey, is there anyone who might, you know, benefit that I might be able to bring value either to their portfolio or really just, you know, have a conversation with them about just investing passively in real estate in general. And I found just a simple ask without, you know, not a sell, but, but as simply, Hey, I'm available. If there's someone that you think would, would bring, find value in this conversation. And I mean, it's been a, a huge, just open the floodgates in terms of people coming to us and it's, you know, it helps. We've had a really strong track record. We've protected capital. We've hit our projections and they've, they've seen that consistency. And so they're happy to bring folks to the table. Um, so I would say that's probably our number one. And the second, we do a lot of just, um, you know, my brother and I run the capital side and we, we do just a lot of interactions through, you know, podcasts, through REIs, through meetup groups, uh, and just staying engaged and trying to add value first before you're ever trying to, to sell an investment. So, you know, try to answer questions, provide, you know, just some, some know-how and just see what other people are looking for. And then, you know, once you kind of bring value to the table, then you can ask and say, Hey, is there an opportunity to bring you into this network? What's the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Number one thing for my success, I would say absolutely. And I know it sounds cliche, but relationships, but I'll take it one step further and relationships with people I genuinely like. Found, <laughs> um, you know, I know it's, it's a catch all to say relationships, but I found to find people that you genuinely enjoy spending time with. It just, it becomes, it takes the work out of it and it becomes, you know, you're spitballing with your, I mean, really it's your, your colleagues, but they're your friends too. And you're able to share new ideas with, send a link to an article, you know, ask their opinion on whether it's a technical question or just a, you know, a new investment type or a deal specific by, by kind of blending, you know, friendship and peers, I found, I mean, that has really motivated me. And I've found it's made me a better person to work with and a better team member, you know, with our internal group here as well. How do you like to give back? I mean, mostly just spend time answering and, you know, asking people, how can I help? Uh, you know, at the end of, of every investor conversation, I'll ask them, hey, outside of this, how can I help? And, you know, they'll have questions about other asset classes they're looking at. They'll, you know, I love being able to make introductions. Uh, I think that's, that's one of my favorite ways when you know exactly the piece that fits their missing piece in their puzzle. And it's usually not you. I mean, I'm certainly not the smartest guy in the room, but if I know someone who's smarter than, than I am and I can introduce them and they can, you know, really piece together that, that, you know, burning question that they had, I get a huge amount of, of just satisfaction from that. So I would say that's, you know, in a perfect world, that is how I would give back every time. Awesome. Well, Neil, it's been a pleasure to get to meet you. Thank you again for your service. Uh, always honored to have uh, servicemen and women on and who are now in, in real estate and doing well. Uh, but it's just been a great conversation about the industrial asset class. We don't have many guests on that are focused in that in that niche. And, and so it's great to learn more about that and just learning about that company and that business and doing due diligence properly on them and what the biggest risks are and, and uh, different thought processes that you all have when you're looking for and buying those properties and the, is the location important or not, you know, uh, but, you know, tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, some general information about our company and business model, you can go to our website. It's Mad Capital Partners is our company. Our website's www.magcp.com. Pretty easy to remember. And then uh, I love to hear, you know, comments, questions. If you're interested in joining our investor network, um, just shoot me a note over email. Um, my name is Neil, N-E-I-L, like the astronaut, at magcp.com. Neil at magcp.com. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.